Hi everybody, GM Matt here to talk about Torg Eternity, which is, as of today at least, June 6th, an upcoming game from uh, Ulysses Spiel, the, the North American branch of L Ulysses Spiel, uh, that is based on a game from the 90s that was simply called Torg. I often call Torg the best role-playing game that I never played. And I guess a little bit of a background on that would be helpful. When I was in college, which would have been in the mid-80s, um, I played several role-playing games, especially played a lot of a D6 version of the Star Wars role-playing game, really the first Star Wars role-playing game that was published by West End Games. It was a wonderful system, especially for the time, and I had a lot of fun with it, and in the course of playing it, I gained a lot of respect for the designers at West End Games. But then I left college, I moved off into kind of a different situation, and no longer had was around the people that I'd been playing games with at the time when Torg was published. But it had been published by West End Games, and so it, in spite of the fact that I didn't really have anybody to play with, I went ahead and picked up the box that Torg came in and opened it up, read through the rules, and just became enamored with this game almost instantly once I started looking at the cards and the dice and the world and the way the world was put together. But unfortunately didn't have anybody to play it with me, but I kept buying adventures and supplements and I would read them and I would roll characters and I would push the characters through combat encounters just to see kind of how all the mechanics worked and fit together. Absolutely loved this game um, and, and loved sort of just T looking in the engine of it and seeing how it worked and picking the pieces apart on it. Um, so when when Ulysses announced that they were going to publish this update, this modernization of the game called Torg Eternity, I was really, really excited because uh, now it's many years later, but uh, Roll20 exists and uh, it's a lot easier for me to find people to get back into to playing these games. And I have been playing this, the Fantasy Flight version of Star Wars, for example. And, I, and uh, as you can see from my channel, I do D&D. And uh, have even been playing a little of the Dresden Files, Accelerated. So really excited to have a chance to get this at least to the virtual tabletop, if not the physical tabletop. And I want to give you a little bit of a very, very unofficial preview. I'm not associated with the folks at Ulysses Spiel at all. I'm just kind of basing this on information that they've already come out with. Uh, just so you can get a feel for what this game is like and maybe think about participating in the Kickstarter. So Torg is a great game for a lot of reasons, but the, there's really three main ones in my mind. One is... It has a multi-genre aspect to it that allows the GM and the players to participate in lots of different kinds of stories. Second, it has this wonderful little mini-game that requires the players to kind of handle resources carefully and gives them a set of resources and cards and points and some things like that. And if they manage those carefully and correctly, it's going to pay off in some big cinematic spectacular event that people often call Torg a cinematic game and I think it gets the flavor of cinema down better than just about anything else that I've seen over the years. So it has this mini game that you're playing that simultaneously is kind of an interesting game in and of itself but that also pushes the game toward a cinematic climax and through a lot of different interesting things on the way. But then you also have this meta game where the players have a way of tangibly having an impact on the world. Uh, it's it's not just well you want a victory, but it doesn't really have any particular significance. You can see physically uh, at at times the players can actually see physically how the world has been changed because of a particular victory that they scored or because of a, a loss that they suffered. And I'll get into that in a little bit more detail as we kind of work through this. But first, the, the general premise of the game. This is a map that I drew up for a kind of an introductory game to Torg. Um, Torg has a somewhat elaborate mythos that surrounds it. 
I'm not going to get into all of the details of that. But the essence of it is this. The earth is kind of this prime plum that can be picked for this kind of energy that uh, people in other realities are, are interested in. This game assumes that not every reality functions exactly under the same laws and rules as our own, and that all of these different kind of fantastical realities that we imagine in literature and uh, film and in all of these other art forms, that these realities actually do exist. And, um, and Earth is kind of a prime place to kind of go in and pick and pull that energy out if you're a part of one of these other worlds. And so you have all of these other different types of reality. You have a horror reality. You have a primitive reality filled with dinosaurs and lizard men and lost world kind of stuff. Um, you, you've got a cyberpunk, uh, near future, kind of dystopian, authoritarian, religious government type reality. You've got a pulp reality that's kind of the, a, a, a tribute to the old comics and the adventures of the 1930s and the 1940s called the Nile Empire. Very Indiana Jones-ish. Uh, you've got a fantasy reality, much like the traditional D&D uh, reality, although... Uh, it's, uh, I'm told, is going to be a little bit more Game of Thrones-ish in the way it's uh, deployed in, in, uh, in Torg Eternity. And you've got some others as well. There's a near future reality that is called Nippon Tech that was called Nippon Tech that I think now is, it's got a different name that is not listed on here. Uh, I think it's Pan Pacifica is the name of it. Uh, but that's an, another kind of interesting uh, twist that they've got. So you've got all of these possibilities. You've got all of these worlds that are coming in trying to drain uh, the core Earth of its own energy, strip it of its own identity, and replace it with their identities, allowing the invaders to become more powerful while Earth becomes more weak and, and subservient. So it's kind of a very classic story arc of fighting against the invaders of your home. But a story arc with an opportunity to tell a lot of different stories in a lot of different kinds of genres. So this is what uh, the, the kind of the core mechanic of the game looks like. This is something called a bonus chart. If you're new to the game, it looks a little intimidating, but really once you get used to using it, not only does it become easy to use, but it actually becomes a fun kind of part of the mini game. The way it works is is you have a D20 mechanic. It's but it's nothing like the D20 mechanic you're probably used to. You roll your D20 and you get a total between 1 and 20. And then that gives you a bonus number to add to your skill. And if that the total number after you add your the bonus number to your skill if it's high enough you succeed in the task. Very very simple. But if you roll a 10 or a 20 your d20 explodes and so you can get up to 25 30 35 40 45 so forth and so on you also have some points remember i told you that there were resources you have points called possibility points you can spend those possibility points to get a chance to roll an extra die and that die is always going to be at least a 10 so th the effect of it is that by the time you put cards and dice and all kinds of different things into play, you can really roll some ridiculously high bonus numbers that get you some really amazing results. In uh, the game world, you just have to be careful about when and how uh, you spend them and, and using them in the best possible situations. So that's how the bonus chart works. The game also has a series of cards that are called destiny cards, and I've lifted all of these out of previews that Ulysses Spiel has come up with. Um, there's a lot more cards than these, but these are great examples. And they, they also kind of show me one other thing about what's going on with this game, which is, um, you know, Ulysses Spiel is not Wizards of the Coast. They're not fantasy flight games. They're a smaller type of operation but boy they're doing a they're going to a lot of lengths just look at this art they're going to a lot of lengths to generate a nice high quality game uh, both in its design and in its art design and 
I, as I think many of you will agree, art design can be as important in a role-playing game as the game design itself is. If you have a really good game design and not really good art, um, sometimes it can really water down the game and not make it nearly as, as entertaining. So they've really gone to a lot of trouble to kind of give us some high quality physical components and uh, art assets to go with the game. And these are uh, three cards you see across the top that are examples of the drama deck. These are cards that the players have in their hands and that they can generally play anytime they want. It works a little different when you're in a, a turn-based situation, but generally you can play these anytime that you want and they give you certain benefits. You want to hold on to them. Like you want to hold on to this drama card um, because this allows you to uh, effectively get another die roll. So when you get, the, get down to that really critical die roll at the end of the game, you're holding this drama card. It's very, very helpful to you. Glory card is another example, and we'll come back to this in a minute. But if you roll a 60 plus and you've got a glory card in your hand, that's when you have a chance to tangibly, visibly change the game world in an appreciable way, affect the war in a tangible way. So one of the goals is gather up the cards, make sure you're holding the glory card, and then go for the big one and try to get your bonus number that you roll on all your dice up to 60 because if you do there's there's some amazing things that happen. Um, the game also has something called Cosm cards and it, it'd be good to note here in addition to that that um, each of these worlds that we talked about a moment ago, each of these invading realities, they each function on a variation of the core rules within Torg so that when you go into Orosh the core rules are going to be modified so that this is a horror realm, so that you have a sense of classic horror. Fear becomes a huge factor. Um, the idea of overwhelming evil uh, and foreboding becomes a factor that works its way mechanically into the rules there. Um, same way in the pulp Nile Empire, action and adventure become something that's a lot more important in Nile Empire. And so here, this is uh, this is a card that appears to be from the living land, which is kind of the lost world. You almost have Jurassic Park type, potential for Jurassic Park type adventures in, in uh, the living land. And, um, and one of the, the features of this world is that it, um, it's, it's better to attack than defend. You don't want to be defensive, you want to be very instinctive and very aggressive because that's the kind of world this is, where everything is very raw and aggressive in the way it behaves. And so this card encourages that. You, each player is going to hold a Cosm card, and uh, they can play that Cosm card at any time they want unless they're in turn-based combat. And that Cosm card both gives them possibilities that they can spend on rolls, but also constrains the players so that it's not really to their benefit to defend in a combat situation, to actively defend. You want to be aggressive in that situation because that's how things are supposed to work. So you've got the cards kind of playing into the flavor of the particular reality that the players are in as well. All right, so um, you also have one other kind of card in the game that I think they're calling in this uh, yeah, the, the ones we talked about before were called destiny cards. These are called drama cards because they're designed to add drama. Now, drama cards generally are used in a turn-based type situation. It may be combat. It could be a chase. Sometimes you just have something called dramatic skill resolution that isn't a combat or a chase, but there's still some turn-based aspects to it. And the card has several uh, features to it. One is at the top. It has a kind of some inspirational text that the GM might use to help set the scene uh, for this particular round. By the way, you flip over one of these at the beginning of each round. So this some inspirational text to help the GM at the top. And then toward the bottom, uh, you see there's two different initiative orders that are set. One is for a scene that's called a standard scene. Think of that. It's just a scene that's maybe in the beginning of an act or in the beginning of a movie where the tension is not really high. Uh, 
there's not a lot that's at stake quite yet. But then you have dramatic scenes where there's a lot at stake. So the final fight with the big boss, the final close to an act where something ends is a bang. That would be an example of a dramatic scene. And depending on whether the scene is standard or dramatic, you may have the villains go first. That's what the V stands for. You may have the heroes go first. And often one party, usually it's just one party, is going to be subject to some kind of a condition. Stymied just means you're having points taken off of your bonus rolls. You're having a couple of points taken off of your bonus rolls if you're stymied. Um, if you're surging, I'm I'm actually not 100% sure about what, what the surge is at the moment. The, there was a rule for it in the other game, but it's a, a positive thing. Um, and then you have at the bottom of the card something that's called approved actions. And these are really kind of an ingenious design to me. Because what these approved actions do is they give the players a chance, if they do one of the approved actions, to get another card to add to their hand. So what that means is the player now has an incentive to do something other than just attack with whatever their best, you know, most optimized attack is. That's a huge problem in almost every design that I've seen, that the to to get the best results out of a particular combat round, the most sensible thing a player can usually do is just find their best attack and roll it against something. And they're do, just doing that again and again and again. That's all combat is. And what approved actions do is they give players motivation to do things other than that, to taunt, to just try to maneuver around without doing an attack. Because by doing that, you get a card, and you, you also simultaneously have some effect on maybe one of your allies' attacks, or maybe you're making it more difficult for the villain to attack. So you end up having this much more dynamic, much more varied type of combat develop during the turns. And that's really, to me, one of the most underappreciated and understated aspects of what made the original Torg so great and what they seem to be doing such a great job of kind of implementing into the new game. So last thing I want to look at here is um, a just an example of a map. The The North American map, this is again comes from one of the Ulysses Spiel previews, the North American map um, shows kind of the zones where uh, the invasion is occurring and you can see almost the entire East Coast, a good part of the American uh, West Coast and then some parts of uh, Mexico it looks like down here and then uh, some parts of Canada up there. This is the living land reality, the one with dinosaurs and uh, lizard men and that kind of thing. And so this shows how the invaders zones are all kind of set up in these series of triangles. Well there's a reason for that. In order to tap this energy that they're trying to steal from the Earth, they have to set up these triangular type zones. And at each end of each of these zones, there is something called a stele. Well, one of the player's objectives is to try to pull up those stele, but they need to do it at a time when it's not going to harm all of the people that are still living within this zone. And so that the zone needs to be kind of filled up with core earth possibility energy is the, the game mechanic before the stele can be destroyed. It's a relatively easy thing in most situations to be able to pull it up or destroy it or get rid of it. The real problem is you don't want to affect so many living things that are within the zone. And so um, that's why this glory card that I showed you earlier is so important. If you get a die roll of 60 points, you can refill all the orbs in the zone with possibility energy, which means you can pull up one of the stele and boom, you've actually eliminated one of the triangles that's on this map. And suddenly in the campaign, the map looks different because of something tangible that the adventurers did during the course of a game. Again, it's, it's so nice to be able to have a direct and immediate impact for, for the players to be able to see a direct tangible aspect in, in this, which is you don't often get in games, even games that are based on um, war type scenarios. So um, the, the game is kickstarting now. Uh, 
for anybody who is interested in it, this is the address for it. I'll put a link to it as well down in the comments on YouTube. Uh, but uh, I highly encourage you to check it out. They have a video that explains the game mechanics of the game. Well, it, they've got one video that gives you an overview of the game, and then, then they actually have an actual play session where you can watch the mechanics of the game uh, in action. It's already pushing up over... It had an $8,000 goal. It's already pushed up over $200,000. It's easily made. You put your money into it, you're guaranteed to get uh, whatever is showing you can get uh, when you buy into it. So um, it, it's, it's well worth checking out. And... Uh, it's, again, I'm just looking forward so much to uh, having an opportunity to finally get this game to the table literally after more than uh, a quarter century.